Hello. So as you know, this podcast has been um, a bit sporadic. But then, who needs schedules? Uh, Actually, most people benefit from a wee bit of organisational scheduling. Anyhow, the reason for this latest silence of this podcast is that I've been working with Lynn on another podcast. Yep, cheating on Connection Requested. But with my wife. And you know what? I think with the way the world is at the moment, you know, with the chaos of elections and associated outrage media and all that malarkey, this other podcast, it's kind of funny and distracting. So I thought I would post the introductory episode here. And if you like it, you can go and listen to the other episodes that are already posted. The podcast is called My Index to Sex, and it is essentially Lynn talking to a friend, Sefi Haven, who was a long-time escort and has an index card for every client that she um, escorted. So obviously there'll be some discussion of sex, sexuality and the like, but it's reasonably light and funny and not really crude at all. And it's a female-only discussion, so I just record and produce. And the music is by Chesney Hawks, which you'll remember from this podcast. So go to mitspodcast.com for more details and... Otherwise, sit back and I hope you enjoy. On Monday, she takes a walk with Johnny. On Tuesday, she has a talk with Jim. On Wednesday, she likes to dance with Tom. Hello, Harry. It's Lynn Ferguson here, and I'm here with Safi Haven. And this is why we are going to do this podcast. Now, it dawned on me, right? Hi, Safi. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. <laughs> I get so excited in what we're doing. Well, excited and not in a sexy way. I get very chatty. So I'm going to say hello. Hi, Lynn. How are you? Hi. I haven't talked to you in like a minute. Um, so about index to sex, what I figured is we should probably talk through the how and the what, but we need to lean into what we are, which is we're friends. We're probably friends. So I hang out with you as a person that I like and I I don't really know (laughs) you know I don't understand what you do and we don't really talk about it because we have so many other things to talk about Mm. right um but I realized that I have an issue about what you do like it sort of makes me go how do you how do you do that I mean and do they have warts and shit (laughs) <laughs> I'm a grown adult. I've given birth twice. I live in a grown-up world where I pay taxes. And yet there are some areas of life where I am completely and utterly immature and make weird assumptions. And your business is one of them. It, it really is. So so that's why I think it's really interesting talking about it, if I'm honest. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think I remember when I first met you, though, and I was thinking, I'm going to to be with her. I'm going to actually have to tell her. And I remember her telling you and there was almost no reaction from you. And I thought, well, maybe she's taking it in (laughs) and she doesn't want to show me what she's thinking. And I don't know if she's telling her husband about this afterwards or what the scoop is. I never know. That's the thing. When I tell somebody. There's always this moment where their face is blank because I think they're (laughs) trying not to react. You know, they're just trying to take it in and not be a dick about it. And so there's this moment, I think, inside of them falling down one side or the other, like, what am I going to do with this information? Especially because I'm standing right in front of them. If I wasn't there, they have a moment to go, what? I don't like this (laughs) bit. I had this this morning, actually, with somebody that I was on a Zoom with, and I didn't know what she was going to say, but I was going to have to work with her. And right. she was younger than me. And she paused. And then she immediately gave me this, you know, the skaters thing with <laughs> the thumb and a pinky. And she's like, gave me that. And she's like, dude, awesome. <laughs> you know? and she's like, I'm really sex positive. And I thought, well, who's sex negative? Yeah, well, I don't you think there's quite a lot of people who are sex negative or that they pretend. I mean, I don't want to get into politics, but it's difficult to not get into politics when you talk about sex, particularly in America, because it seems like one of the greatest offences in the political world is not that people are starving or dying or there's a whole imbalance on money, but it does seem to be that if women have sex, then that's a problem (laughs) politically (laughs) for a party here, especially if they enjoy it. 
I think there's a level of sex maturity or whatever, like talking about sex and yeah. when you get to the, what is it, to the, through the, <laughs> get going. But there's an area of the sex maturity that I talk about that's Jimmy Osmond. The reason I call it Jimmy Osmond is because when I was younger, I really wanted to marry Jimmy Osmond. Like, I really wanted to marry him. Jimmy Osmond or Donny Osmond? Jimmy Osmond. He's, like, more age-appropriate for me. Okay. And he's cuddly and everything, right? And he's not been well. So if you're listening to this, Jimmy, and why would you, frankly? But if you are, thank you. And I hope you're feeling better because you seem like a lovely guy. Anyway, I wanted to uh, marry Jimmy Osmond. We would live and uh, we'd have a purple house and all that stuff. Oh, really? And we would have to have kids, right? But I didn't like any of that take your clothes off nonsense, right? I, but I, I thought I could just muscle through it in order to get the kids. And then <laughs> Jimmy would understand. We would just do it twice and then we'd get kids and that would be fine, right? And I think there are still some people who talk that way. My point is I don't believe that everybody is together on sex. And I think that somebody who earns a living in a way that you have earned your living, my darling, must be complicated to see what people are like because we're not all mature that way. It's interesting because I think a lot of people are happy to talk about sex. And I think people are sex positive, but I also think that they don't want other people to to think that for instance, when I wrote my first book, people read it, but people wouldn't tell each other that they read it because they didn't want <laughs> to know that they approved or anything. And it's not that, okay, I'll give you another, for instance, when I was doing stand up and I would go to these shows and wait because I was nobody. And, you know, you would listen to the other comedians and men would be doing jokes about their dick and, you know, women's cunts and you know blah blah and then girls would get up and be like my vagina is this way and that way and, and then I would go up and I have no dirty talk no swear words nothing all I talk about is being paid for sex being an escort and I was told by several MCs who shows they were there, like I really can't have you back it's just not a family friendly moment it's not really about the sex as much as it is about accepting that somebody is getting paid for it we're not allowed to be okay with that. And if we are okay with it inside, which a lot of people are, they'll say, oh, I think it's great what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> but they won't tell a friend that I know somebody who does this. It's not something that people want other people to know they approve of. Younger generations are much different than what we were. I also heard that young girls now are painting their nails the color of their man's pee-pee. I, no. I heard that this morning and I nearly thought, why do you, I think that's, well, okay, that's odd and I don't want to know about it too much, but yeah. <laughs> like I don't need to dive deep into that, but also. Again, this is an illustration of how vanilla I am because I'm like, well, surely everybody's painting their nails the same color then. Are there a great variation in the colors of peepees? Because I'm guessing you've seen quite a lot of peepees in your time. No, I didn't even think about it when I heard this. And I thought, oh, yeah. I guess there are. And well, the other girl who told me uh, said that the nail specialist was brought pictures. And so I guess ranges of pink, ranges of brown, ranges of purple. So there's, I guess, different shades. I have so many questions, which is why I'm really glad we're going to do a podcast. Because I have so many questions. Like, the first one is, I am guessing that you didn't set out, uh, you know, like when you were around the Jimmy Osmond getting married years, of course you couldn't have married Jimmy Osmond because he was mad. Oh, we would have thought. When you were your younger self, I'm guessing you didn't plan this as a career, did you? Or oh, did you? sure. I grew up and thought, oh, I can't wait to be a prostitute. <laughs> what a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> You know, I wonder though, because if people are painting their nails the color of somebody else's pee pee, there must be something going on. How did it come about? Yeah, I do think young women today are much different about it. In the olden days, it was awful. It was a terrible thing to be a prostitute. Terrible. And there yeah. were really only two ways it was looked at, which by the way, in our media is still only looked at in these two ways. You're either this destitute girl with a terrible abusive background who's got a pimp who's living on the street, you know, or there's this really high class, well-kept mercenary, bitchy woman that wouldn't think twice about stealing your husband if he gave her money. Yeah. So there wasn't much else in my head. I thought this is incredibly scary. What happened was I 
went to many years of school. I got a lot of student loans. I graduated thinking I would get work, but I was an actor and I didn't. <laughs> and so I needed to sort of save myself with a job and also pay my student loans, but also have the ability to go on auditions and things like that. I got fired from many waitress jobs. because Apparently food service is not my thing. Out of desperation, initially, I ended up answering an ad. And in the back of the village voice that said, girls, 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 earn $1,000 a week. Escorts wanted no sex involved. And I thought, oh, well, no sex. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did you didn't talk to an African prince at the same time. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, Snappy, you're no. <laughs> well, you know, I, I thought, oh, yeah, you could escort men to the charity balls and I don't know, like balls was on my mind, charity balls or dinner or something, you know, and I'd get to wear a long dress and be on the arm of some wealthy man, you know, and then I got there and I realized, oh, yeah, there's definitely sex involved. <laughs> but I did the first, my first appointment and it wasn't horrifying. In fact, I sort of, it was very quick and I thought, oh God, that was like 10 minutes and I have $200. That's so much shorter than a restaurant shift, you know. Also, I'm not covered in food. You know? Did you have to do? Did you have to do the thing? I mean, was it straight no. to the pee pee? No, it was what? straight to the pee pee, but it wasn't. I didn't. Yeah. Well, it's a longer story, but basically, uh, the, the guy kind of just wanted to put it in my mouth, and he was sort of one, two, three, and that was it. And he had a condom on, and he toddled off to the bathroom with the condom dangling. And uh, I sort of was still on my knees going, I have $200. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Why didn't I think of this before? But then the night got a little tougher and, you know, it was not as simple a business as I thought. So you got $200 for the man doing the weenie in the mouth thing, right? And then did you, sorry, I, I can't believe I just went through that so fast. But like, I just, I'm like, because I know you. I'm like, well, so that's the thing that happened. And then we did the thing. But then what happened? Did the next day, did you go, oh, okay. I think I felt really sad and bad about it because the thing that was sad to me was I was very romantic and I wanted my own Jimmy Osmond, you know, and I thought, I'm going to have true love and I'm going to like some man's going to be my soulmate and we'll just have each other for the rest of our lives till we die. And I wanted that so much, but I was so romantic and I would date guys and they would just want sex and I would give it because I thought, well, you know, maybe he'll like me afterwards. And they usually would kind of just use you and drop you. And I think as a young woman, this was really painful. And I wondered what was wrong with me. And I wondered why men wouldn't see me as a keeper. And then also having that on top of what happened just after Juilliard, which was, we, we're not going to have you as an actress at, from casting directors and agents because you're not attractive. You're not fuckable. And so all this right. kind of piling up. So when I found myself in that business, I thought, well, I seem to be fuckable. I don't know. But this, <laughs> and I'm also getting paid for it. And it used to be that I'd go on dates with guys and I pay them with sex for the dinner. And now yeah. they're paying me just to show up. And that's pretty amazing. So it was this interesting turn of tables that happened right in the beginning that mm. was simple, but really kind of went to a place that mattered. And then yeah. with men as dates, yeah. I thought, well, I can't date while I'm doing this. So I'm not going to worry about that right now. But as it happened, men started to really like me. And I thought, well, what's different about, there were girls there, Lynn, that were supermodels. I mean, they were like, I would cower next to them going, oh, don't send me out next to her, please. <laughs> you know? Oh my God. You know, I'm so girl next door looking that it was like, oh no. And there were girls who loved sex and talked about it. And I was just this average girl next door. And I thought, why do they like me? I don't know. I started getting a lot of callbacks and a lot of men not just seeing me for the hour, but for longer. Yeah. And then I sort of realized as time went on, the one thing I had that wasn't looks or anything else was that I liked people and truly listened and somehow, for whatever reason, reflected back to men how amazing they were. What that little spark in them that was amazing, that sort of got dulled or wasn't responded to over the years. And I thought, oh, well, here, 
it matters. And that was my superpower in a way. It's kind of that thing about the, our friendship, which is if I say to people that I've got this friend, Sethi, and she does that, then you can see them go, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, if you met her, you would really like her too because she cares about the world and feelings and the universe. And, and I've never known anybody that likes animals and living creatures as much as you do, you know. Oh. So I, I wonder if having that sort of appreciation of of the feelings of other living creatures is what made it possible. Because I've got to tell you, Sefi, I just, even though when we talk about it, I'm like, it's so not for me. But then again, you know, I do stuff where I know that you would look at it and go, that's not for me. In fact, no, you wouldn't because you're lovely. You would go, well, that sounds lovely. <laughs> and I'm sure I would do it right now. <laughs> so tell me, did you have like, did you have a huggy bear like pimp thing or what was going on there? Was it like Starsky and Hutch like hanging out or did you have somebody who managed it or did you have to do it yourself? When I first took that job, I got really lucky because I could have gone many different ways. I soon learned. I answered the ad that happened to be an agency run by this incredible woman. Her name was Susan. She was a powerhouse of a woman. Do you remember that movie with Meryl Streep, The Devil Wears Prada? Yeah. So my, Susan was like that. She was tough. She knew exactly what she was doing. She was meticulous with numbers. She paid every dime of her taxes. She made sure the girls got paid. But you had to do exactly what she said. You had rules and you didn't break them. And when I first started working for her, <laughs> I was sitting on the sofa having applied it was like a real job interview. And I was like, this is for prostitution, right? I mean, come on. You know, it was like, this was a tough application. And they asked me if I had my driver's license. I'm like, come on. We're backstreet girls now, you know? <laughs> so she came out, saw me, went back into the office and said, what the hell pizza is on my sofa? And then she came back out and she said, because I, Lynn, I showed up wearing granny shoes, purple tights, I was bohemian Salvation Army chic. And she was like, this is a high class escort agency, you know. And so she gave me all the rules right then. No drugs, show up on time. You work an entire shift from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. No matter wow. how tired you are. You have to be there within 30 minutes or less like Domino's Pizza. You have two separate names. One is for $300 an hour. One is for $200 an hour. That way she could capture both audiences of men who, depending on their budget, you don't give out your card. You don't give your number to men. You have to wear stockings, not pantyhose. There's all these rules. Yeah. And she ran yeah. a really tight ship. So she was great because I learned a lot from her about how to manage an hour appointment, how to extend it into longer appointments, how to manage time mm -hmm. and what you do in that time. And she also had a, a lot of girls that were so wonderful working for her that I learned a lot from them. And we all banded together. I never had female friendships as great as when I worked for her. These women wow. were incredible and beautiful. And so when finally I left the business for a little while, because I did meet my Jimmy Osmond, but that didn't work out. But then I came back into the business and the business had changed a little because this thing called the internet came out. Oh. And so it gave us a chance to be independent because when I worked for Susan, we split 50-50. And rightly so. She did more than half the work. Well, she did half the work. She did the advertising and everything else and sending us out. And she kept the records and she kept the phone calls. And so it was a lot of work that we didn't normally see. And so what she did at the time, because we didn't have computers as a main thing, is she had all these index boxes on her desk of thousands and thousands and thousands of clients and girls and whatever else. And she would have the girl box on one side and the client's boxes on the other. And the gentleman would say his name and she'd see if he was a repeat client, go through and she'd put his information on hmm. one card and the girl's information on another. So my working names, both prices, I was Natasha for 300 and Gwen for 200 Natasha was your very beautiful, very elegant model actress, whereas Gwen was your very cute, very sweet girl next door. <laughs> then she would put on my measurements, you know, 34, whatever, 20s. Everybody had a 24-inch waist. It didn't matter. <laughs> and you were all 26, and that was it. <laughs> Unless you were younger, which is what she went with. But if you were anything over 26 in real life, you were 26. 
and however breast size this and hair color and so forth. And then with the men, she had put on any pertinent information plus their credit card information, or whether they paid cash or credit card or check or what they paid. So there would have been an index card of you. Yes, there was. And two different ones, Natasha and Gwen. And the reason she did that was they advertised in the yellow pages and they had some uh, ads that were like, you know, the high class one, Crown Club. And every time you called that number, you, you know, wanted the highest class lady you could find. And then there was these other ones like Escapade, you know. And those were for budget seekers because, you know, not, not the true budget, but. $200 an hour at the time was a lot. Did you ever get a situation like, because for most people, it's that thing where you go, oh, I said I was going to the store, but really here you've caught me at the cinema. <laughs> Did you ever have your version of going, well, you know, I said I was Natasha, but oh, hello, you've booked Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but not in that moment because Susan was so organized. She was a Virgo, you know, come on, you can't beat that. So <laughs> she, she would never let it happen in her service. But something like that happened to me years later under somebody totally different who was a madam in Chicago who didn't have quite the same organizational skills. She had a big network and she ended up sending me to somebody twice under wrong names. But he had a great sense of humor. He thought I was for some reason adorable and decided he needed to marry me. So that was a whole different story. But <laughs> but but yeah, and then when I came in, he's like, aha. It's <laughs> like, okay, you caught us. You're there to have fun. So nobody's going to be upset. <laughs> well, it depends because there's cranky ones that you've talked about before who were angry. They would have been upset. They would have been upset, but that would have been solved very quickly the minute I was in my lingerie. So, How many different identities would you say that you've had over the period of time that you were working? I started out as Natasha and then I'm yeah. Gwen, and that was during the agency, which I still have some of those men that switched over into the index to sex area because right. once the agencies went out, they found their favorite girls. But- then when I moved to L.A., which is kind of when it started, I became Natalie. What was she? Was she a model? Was she an actress? What was Natalie? Natalie was as close as it was going to be to me. And then when I moved back to New York, somebody already took Natasha, the name. So I had to, it was like having to get a new password. No, you've used that password. <laughs> so I became Delilah. And that was an interesting period of time because I had a lot of good girlfriends that were escorts. And we became this posse of really close women. So that was a really great period of time. And then when I went totally on my own, I became Sasha, which is what I was known as for almost 20 years. And that's where I became the number one escort as Sasha. And then after that, I left the business, but had to come back for a terrible, terrible reasons. But anyways, when I came back, I became Scarlet. Was Scarlett angry? Was she angry after the things that had happened? Was she like, no more shit to him back? You know, it was a whole, it's so funny. It wasn't so much that I changed my persona. It was how the business changed and how mm. I had to adapt to it. Because once I came back as Scarlett, women were no longer advertising on certain sites anymore. Now they were doing it on Twitter. And so I didn't want to do that. And so there was, yeah. it was kind of finding your way differently. And, and then finally, in the end, of all that, I ended up just going back to my own name, not Sefi, but my own, you know, Sefi is my writer name. I tell you, asking you questions sometimes is really difficult. So you've been a lot of different people. And so then the main names during the index to sex period of time is mostly Sasha. So it's Sasha's time. Yeah. Yeah. I would say cool. Yeah. As an escort with an agency, I kept this little uh, book that I had in my purse. Uh, all the girls had them. They were just little notebooks, you know, uh, and they would just say the name of the person you saw, the date, how long you saw him for over the one hour, two hours, however many, how much you were to make and your split of it. Because at that time I worked for an agency and they took 50%. So how much you paid. And then whether it was cash or credit card or check, because we actually had checks at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's crazy. Why would people write yeah. when that would be like, oh, for general sexiness and light relief, <laughs> the sum of <laughs> for love and pleasure? Yeah, 
Yeah. And so that was that book. Oh, God, I sound so old. I sound so old. Listen, you're talking to me, and I remember when the invention of the fax machine was a thrill. Yes. So, no, you do not sound old. Okay. Sound realistic. But when the internet came out, it gave you the chance to be independent, which was a good thing because I was now living in L.A., in LA, you could not find escort agencies anywhere. You would open the phone book in New York and you could, you know, use that phone book for a step stool because of all the escort ads. Yeah. But in LA, when I moved there, I opened the phone book and there were none. Zero escort ads. That's because the police presence in LA focused on busting escorts than most anything else. Whereas in New York, they kind of went, we're not going to look at it unless it's an election year. You know, they don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> but in L.A., it was like their mission. doesn't matter what gangs are going on. The thing was the escorts. So I had to really dip underground and find a network, which I eventually did because I knew what to look for. But mm -hmm. in L.A., you almost had to be independent. And so I, when I first set up, I was thinking, how am I going to run my own business? Because now I have to do everything. I have to advertise, get the client, run the business, so forth. And I didn't know how to do that. So I remembered what Susan did. And I just sort of imitated the way that she organized and the way that she did. I went to Office Depot and bought this huge index box very optimistically. I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have people. And then I found a place to advertise that was this site called That Mall. And it was, you know, one of the original places that you could advertise on the internet. And the reason that mattered was in the olden days with the phone books, it cost $5,000 to advertise in the yellow pages. Girls no. couldn't do it on their own. That's why they couldn't be independent. But the advertisements on that mall were $25 a month. So it made it yeah. affordable. They didn't organize it. So it could be like a plumber and yes. you know a TV technician and an escort and a chef, you know, all advertising their services next to each other. Hungry for something? We can sort you out. Want your pipe fixed? Call me. <laughs> we could just join forces. So, <laughs> so that's what it was. And then as I got better at being independent, my box grew and grew. And so I was independent for the rest of the time then, mostly. I still worked for some of the agencies until they all kind of closed up. So the other thing that I want to ask you as well, because these are logistic questions. They really are. They are, right? Like, how many years would you say that these index cards cover? Like, how many years of clients? I'm going to say probably a little over two decades. Wow. So, I just, yeah, I would say over a little over two decades. So, you're talking about 20 years of men that you've, you know, seen their but no. <laughs> it's like an index box of a, of a lot of people. Is it all in one big filing cabinet or do you have separate filing cabinets? Do you have, like, for example, do you have one that's just for gingers? Do you have, like, gingers? <laughs> or do you have one that's, like, angry people? Not that angry people are gingers or gingers are angry people. I don't mean that at all. But, I mean, do how do you categorize them? Is it just alphabetically in one big box or are there different categories or what? Okay. Well, you know, I'm a ginger, so you're staring right at me. I know. <laughs> and, and that's why I said gingers are not angry people, because you looked at me with a fairly angry expression. It's just thinking she's looking at me. I have ginger brain. I have a big plastic container full of many index boxes, but mm -hmm. uh, index tubes, I guess you call them. Several of them are just alphabetized. A for Anthony, Adam, whatever. And they're regular clients that would see me once in a while or a lot or once every two years or something. like. And then I had a box. I don't know other girls if they had index boxes, but we certainly kept a file of men that we called blacklisted. They were oh. men who misbehaved either to some other girl or to us. It could be like making an appointment and not showing up or right. making an appointment and always showing up late. Or making an appointment and shorting you a few dollars and never making good on that. Or showing up and not paying you, which would be considered rape, actually. Or scary things like, well, one time I had somebody who he was so careless with the information that other people in his life were calling me, asking me who I was to him. Oh, And so that's not good. 
So yeah, so there was this blacklist box and then there was the regular oh. box and then there was the box of other women that I knew that either I could work with or that I didn't trust or that I had to blacklist from helping them. So there was many boxes. A woman of many boxes. I, I think that if we, in each episode, take a card out of the box and then just talk about them. And obviously, because I need to have a job in this, I will assign a, a name for whoever this person is. Because I'm guessing people still do have attitude about it. And I'm guessing your clients um, would be like, no, don't let oh. her know. Plus, I would never tell on it. Never tell. So I'll assign a name and then we'll pick out a card and then we'll just talk about it. You have access, a perspective of the world that I I really don't have access to and I probably never will. And I think, <laughs> I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think that most people, people are totally curious about prostitution, right? right? Yeah. So I, I think like going through and, and just picking out a card and finding out what worked? What was behind the doors in the place where it was an escort? No sex required, <laughs> total sex required. And then that's what we'll do. Let's do it. It's kind of asking the question, what if everything you thought you knew about prostitution was wrong? The business is mostly filled with actually pretty awesome people that you might not know are living right next door because I lived next door to a lot of people and nobody knew. I also think that when you know about stuff, you can stop being frightened of it. I I wish um, that we were given a voice in the mainstream entertainment and media. They'll do shows on male escorts. They'll do shows on high class, you know, it's mostly men's imaginations of what escorts are, or even women's imaginations of what, but there's rarely a room for the 80% of us that is actually the truth of what it is. And it's funny and it's, hilarious and it's poignant and it's really moving and it, it it deals so much more with what people I'm going to speak for men mostly but yeah. for men that I met really wanted which was a connection and to be seen and felt and heard in an intimate way that somehow mm-hmm. wasn't happening I think that's a brilliant yeah. way to end this so the next time me and Sefi join you we'll pull an index card out of a box and it will be my index to six. That bozo of mine, cause she's the sweetheart of six other guys. You have been listening to My Index to Six, produced by Ferdal LLC. The music was performed by Chesney Hawks, and you can learn more about Sefi Haven at sefihaven.com. Go to mitspodcast.com to check out the show notes for more details, including how to stay in touch, give feedback, and ask questions. All the best. Sunday's my only time with that bozo of mine, cause she's the sweetheart of six other guys.